The Holy Gospel, our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, it is as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing of camel's hair with a belt, leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I will baptize, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to another day in paradise. How many of you like to receive Christmas cards this time of year? How many of you like to receive Christmas cards? You know, i got to admit, I love to receive Christmas cards. I especially like Christmas cards with the traditional Christian artwork on the cover. You know, the Courier and Ives type or the uh, Thomas Kincaid. Any one of those will do quite well, thank you very much. You know, the Lamb with the Lion, the three is wise men in the message, wise men still seek him, the Madonna and Child, or the star piercing the dark darkness over the stable in the manger. All are beautiful depictions of the Christmas story. I am positive that as a group of us, we have all viewed thousands of Christmas cards just like these. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, we, we've all got hundreds and hundreds of them. Yet I do not recall ever receiving a card with John the Baptist preaching in the desert. Have you? Anybody here got a card like that? I can picture it in my mind. A card showing the dead, barren wilderness of Judea out by the Jordan River with this animated prophetic figure as the focal point. But I have never seen one that even closer resembles such a scene, and I'm sure you haven't also. John the Baptist is a totally inappropriate way we celebrate Christmas. Christmas is about the birth of Christ, as Matthew and Luke reported to the Holy Night so many years ago. We celebrate Mary, Joseph, the angels, the manger, shepherds, wise men. A child is born unto us. Glory to God in the highest. That is what Christmas is all about. Jesus is the reason for the season. That's a familiar saying, right? So we honor the sweet child, the sweet little boy Jesus, and we get warm fuzzies, and we hug our family members. So what does John the Baptist have to do with Christmas? For Mark, in his Gospel, it means everything. Instead of Bethlehem and choirs of angels, Mark begins his story of Jesus' coming with a prophet blaring and baptizing in the wilderness of Judea. In doing so, he adds a new figure to the good news about the incarnation and the coming of Jesus the Messiah. And that person is John the Baptist. Throughout the centuries, the Church has recognized Mark's unique contribution through its observance of Advent in preparation for the celebration of Christmas. Who would you say was the greatest man that was ever born? If you're a Christian, you might say, well, Jesus Christ, of course. We all agree with that? I think that's pretty much... Suppose Jesus himself were asked the question, what do you suppose he would say? You might be surprised to know that Jesus once attributed that distinction of greatness to a certain man. He told his disciples, I tell you, among those born of woman, there is no one greater than John, yet one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Jesus was referring to John the Baptizer. And John the Baptizer was an amazingly popular figure, and he was a major celebrity in those days. Everyone in Jerusalem and people from all over Judea, the Judean countryside, went out to listen to him. They loved to hear him preach, that fire and brimstone. They didn't just listen, they responded. They confessed their sins and were baptized. 
Not only was John popular, but he was also very, very successful. For all his popularity and success, though, John was strikingly different than the average man. Many people respond to great popularity and success with a certain degree of pride and swagger. But from the beginning, John the Baptizer was entirely different. Perhaps you've heard, seen the slogan, It's Not About Me. Have anybody ever heard that? It's Not About Me? That was the root of John's message. He preached about someone else, someone who would come after him, whose sandal thongs John did not consider himself worthy to even tie. John wasn't interested in the spotlight. He wasn't interested in the praise or admiration of others. He was only interested in preparing the way for someone else. And he didn't let personal ambition get in the way of doing his job and doing it well. John was a baptizer. Among the preparations he made for the coming of Christ was a task of preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It was into this kind of baptism that people listened to him, entered into baptism that was not an invention of John, nor was it unique to the Israelites. From ancient times, baptism was a well-known symbol, an outward sign of a new spiritual birth, of entering into a new form of life. For those who John baptized, it marked their confession that they were indeed sinners. When we admit we are sinners, we are laying aside our human pride and confessing the truth of what we really are. But we are not making that confession blindly. We are making it in the light of the revealed knowledge that God loves us immeasurably and that God has made atonement for us in the form of Jesus Christ. In other words, because God has revealed to us that he is for us, we are free in Christ both to fearlessly acknowledge our sinfulness before God and free to accept God's gift of atonement and his new creation of us, for us, in Jesus Christ. Because we have met with the grace of God in Jesus, we can entrust ourselves to him fully and without reservation. Safe in his love, we can give over to him even the crushing burdens of our darkest sins and fears. Within that confession of our sinfulness is our recognition that we need, indeed need, God's forgiveness. We admit that we are rebels who have betrayed God's love, and we place ourselves at his mercy, having now renounced our rebellion and pledging faithful obedience to him. But in actually becoming that new person, entering that new life, turning over the new leaf, is another question entirely. When we try to do that, we find ourselves failing, fighting old ways, but losing so often we can always often fall into despair. That is, unless we trust God to be who he really is for us in the form of Jesus. In Christ, we are a new creation, we are told by Paul, both in Corinthians and Galatians. And we are set free, Paul tells us, in Galatians. God has freed us to be a new, redeemed, healed, and complete person. He has made us to be in Christ. We can use that gift of freedom to hear and obey our Heavenly Father, or we can reject it and continue to live as though God has not made us his covenant partner, as though he has not made us the beloved recipient of his overflowing grace and love that he gave to us through Jesus. No longer must we live in spiritual bondage, struggling in vain to grasp here and there a little respect, dignity, security, and love in this heartless world. No longer must everything in life be about us and our anxieties about not getting all the things that we think that we want. No longer must we live in opposition to God, ourselves, and our neighbors. The Holy Spirit, God's gift to us, gives us both the ears to hear God's words, commands, and provides us our new life in Christ. In that life provided by the Holy Spirit, we are free to choose to be the person in Christ God has already chosen for us to be. To do otherwise is not freedom, but is the return back to bondage. All this repenting, believing and passing through the water of baptism, has meaning only because God gives them meaning. 
only because the Son of God took the indescribable action of becoming one with us, living sinlessly as one with us, dying on the cross as one of us, being resurrected as one of us, and ascending to and being saved by the Father as one of us. And does any of it make sense at all? It does make sense. It makes sense because God, in his divine freedom to be who he wants to be for our sakes, makes it, makes it sense. We are saved by God's grace, by his love, by his utter faithfulness to his redemptive purpose for humanity that he loves so much that Jesus took humanity itself into himself and became like you and me. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus Christ and through Christ to reconcile himself all things in heaven and earth through his death and resurrection. That is the way God chose to make us into a new creation. The Son of God took humanity into himself and in perfect obedience, sacrificial love, he considered humanity to God and he reconciled us to God. It is to this God, the God who immeasurably loves himself to humble himself, to take all our burdens upon himself, including our ugly sins, and to turn us into a new and beautiful creation in his Son, so that we owe complete allegiance and obedience to him. God has given us a new chance, a new life, new possibilities, and that is because he gave us his Son. John the Baptist's ministry was a ministry of humility. Baptism is an expression of humility. The Son of God humbled himself to become one of us for our sake. And the new life in Christ that is given to us by our Creator and Redeemer is a life full of humility. It's not about me. It's not about you. If it were about me, what would I do? How can I heal my own past, my present? and my future? How can I redeem my own faults, my sins, my betrayals, and my rebellion? How can I secure my future or the future of those that I care about? No, thank God, it's not about me. It's about Jesus Christ, the Son of God incarnate, God in the flesh, who came for our sake. He is the one who heals our personal history, redeems our every dark sin, secures our future, and gives us deep peace and rest that only he can provide. Praise be to God that that we can drop all our airs of superiority and pride and humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God because he is truly all in all. It is only God who can give us the peace that passes all understanding. Thanks be to God. Amen.